Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for the Elkton Bible Baptist Church Electronic Edition. Um, appreciate everybody being here today. Hope you are well uh, on this Sunday morning. Um, we'd like to invite you to 
uh, worship with us, and then we'll share from the word here in a little bit as well. Let's open this morning with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we would invite you, Lord, to, to this time, this time of, of worship, this time of study. Uh, we would invite you to speak uh, to our hearts in this season uh, with, with all that is going on, that you, Lord, would, would bring wisdom, that you would bring comfort where comfort is needed, and then ultimately, Lord, that, that out of that you would be glorified by what goes on uh, here in this place, in our homes, in, in our workplaces, in, in the, the things that we do, Lord, that you would be glorified and the world will see you clearly uh, in us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. you the meaning of that name, Emmanuel, God with us. Emmanuel, it is wisdom's mystery, God with us. Sages look at it and wonder. Angels desire to see it. The plumb line of reason cannot reach halfway into its depth. The eagle wings of science cannot fly so high, and the piercing eye of the vulture of research cannot see it. God with us. It is hell's terror. Satan trembles at the sound of it. 
His legions fly apace. The black-winged dragon of the pit quails before it. Let Satan come to you suddenly and do you but whisper the word, God with us, and back he falls, confounded and confused. Satan trembles when he hears that name. God with us. It is the laborer's strength. How could he preach the gospel? How could he bend his knees in prayer? How could the missionary go into foreign lands? How could the martyr stand at the stake? How could the confessor acknowledge his master? How could men labor if that one word were taken away? God with us is the sufferer's comfort, is the balm of his woe, is the alleviation of his misery is the sleep that God gives to his beloved, is the rest after exertion and toil. God with us is eternity's sonnet, is heaven's hallelujah, is the shout of the glorified, is the song of the redeemed, is the chorus of angels, and is the everlasting oratorio of the great orchestra of the sky. Okay, thank you so much for joining us for worship. would like to invite you to grab your Bible. Uh, we are going to do some talking this morning uh, about Advent. It, uh, it is Advent time. We are uh, coming up on, on Christmas and that time of year when we remember uh, the coming of Christ. And so what I'd like to talk about uh, in way of introduction this morning is, is to the idea of, of gathering information. We as a people are accustomed to having information, having information right now. I mean, we, uh, a few years ago, invented a verb based on the name of a company. It's a verb that we use for describing looking for information, right? You, you grab a device and you Google something. That was not a verb 20 years ago. We, uh, we we grab our device, we Google something, and we have 3.2 million answers in about, you know, 58 hundredths of a second. And we're accustomed to that. And I, I have a question. I, I had a question this morning earlier, and I did exactly that. Opened up my, my internet on my phone, blah, 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 typed my, my question in, and, you know, I had everyone's opinion just like that. Sometimes we forget that it hasn't always been that way. And I remember the days of of Googling stuff in the Encyclopedia Britannica. You went down to the library and, and sat there in the library and, and began to pull volumes and read and then go pull another volume and read a, a cross-reference and, and do all that good stuff. And perhaps more importantly, sometimes you just didn't get an answer. And sometimes you just didn't know. Uh, and, and you might have to search for years to find the answer to your question. There wasn't anyone on the internet who had already had the question and answered it for you just like that. All of that information searching is part of who we are. Mankind was created with, with a bunch of traits. Among those is that desire to know, that desire to investigate. And one of the primary things that we are, are called to know, we're called to investigate, uh, is to know the, the God who created us. 
We were designed for that. We were designed with this, this desire in us to know the one who made us. Uh, in the garden, of course, Adam and Eve had that, right? They walked with God in the cool of the day, the text says. Every day, every day they, they walked with God. They were able to know him in a way that none of us has been uh, able to do since. And, of course, they, they messed that up uh, for themselves and for us. And mankind was left with this, this very veiled, uh, very distant relationship with their creator. Such that, that even when people wanted to know God, when this was, uh, you, they, they understood this as a goal and they went after it, uh, there were still problems. I'd like you to take a look at Exodus chapter 33. I'm going to read verses 17 through 23. Uh, read along with me if you would. Uh, Exodus uh, 33, uh, starting in verse 17. And so the Lord spoke to Moses, I will also do this thing of which you have spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. Then the Lord said, behold, there's a place by me and you shall stand there on the rock and it will come about while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back, but my face you shall not see. That text says that God knew Moses by name. They had a close and intimate relationship. And Moses was looking for more. There, verse 18, it says that Moses wanted to see God's glory. More than he, Moses, had seen to that point. He wanted to see God's glory. Hang on to that idea of glory because it's important. So God speaks back to Moses and, and, uh, and tells him, Hey, you know what? I'm going to make my, my goodness pass before you. I'm going, to, I'm going to speak my name. I'm going to do all of these amazing things. But Moses, there's a problem. You cannot look at my face. You cannot look at God's face and live. And so Moses, I'm going to do these things for you because you and I have this, this close, intimate relationship. But it can't be as close as you want it. You can't see my full glory and survive. God is too holy, and Moses is too not holy. No one can look at God's face and live. And that would be a terrible place to stop. That would be a horrible place to, to end the story. We are created for this, this desire to know. We have this built into who we are, and into those who would chase after God have this desire to know him, to, to see his glory, and to have him say, nope, sorry, that can't happen. To end the story there would be horrible. But of course the story does not stop with Moses. God continues to speak to his people. You, you work your way through the rest of the Old Testament and God continues to show up. He continues to show himself in some form to his people. He does for, for Joshua. He does for Isaiah. Uh, he does for Ezekiel. He does for Daniel. You see uh, these people who, who get to see some glimpse of God and they get to learn some more little piece of the plan. Because God is, is not intending to stay distant forever. He intends, to, he intends to, to disclose himself. He intends to show himself. He intends for us to have that information. And so little bits at a time, as we read through the rest of the Old Testament, we see bits of the mystery. 
We see bits of, of God's plan uh, being formed uh, as he speaks to the prophets, as he speaks to the kings, uh, as he interacts with mankind. And those bits and pieces finally come together in the advent. All of this leads to, to Jesus coming. And so when we come to this time of year uh, when, when we, we choose to remember the advent and to remember the, the birth of Christ. Whether it was this time of year or some other time of year, that's debates for guys with bigger brains than me. But we have this time of year set aside to remember that, that God had a plan. A plan to intersect the lives of mankind. And that was, was in the person of Jesus Christ. And so we get to this time of year and we find ourselves reading Luke 2. We find ourselves thinking about the theological implications of the Penis Christmas special. Right? I, I, I've preached that, for goodness sake. Uh, we come to this point and we remember the, the, the awe and the wonder. I, I think it's off camera right now, but there's a, there's a manger scene set up off here to my left. Uh, getting ready for the, the, the kids' uh, Christmas program next week. And, and, and that... You know that manger scene uh, there, and we have a we have a star up over it, and all of those, all of those symbols, those things that we remember at this time of year. Uh, because the story didn't stop with Moses. Thing is, I'm not going to read Luke two today. Uh, I highly recommend it at this time of year. Right, you, some point you need to sit down and and read Luke two. Or, or, or watch the peanut special. Listen to Linus recite Luke 2 for you. Uh, and, and, and watch him set down his blanket when, he's, when he says, do not fear. Do those things, right? Remember that. But today, today I want to take you to John chapter 1. Not a traditional sort of, of Christmas passage necessarily. Uh, go to John chapter 1. We're going to begin at verse 14. All right, so uh, verses 14 through 18 of John chapter 1. It says, The Word became flesh, and He dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about Him and cried out, saying, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for He existed before me. For of His fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten of God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. Now we were introduced earlier in John chapter 1 to, uh, to Jesus as the Word, the Logos uh, of God. It is the, the full expression, full spoken expression of God. And we read that He was eternal with the Father and that He was responsible for creation. And then we come to this passage, uh, beginning here at verse 14, and, and we pick up this story of the Logos, the Word, again. And it tells us that the Logos, the spoken expression of God, became flesh. Greek word is sarx. It, it became flesh. And the word refers, quite frankly, to the stuff that we are made of. Right? Just as simple as going to the butcher shop and buying meat, buying flesh. And, and so in, in traditional Greek, it's, it is just that. It is just this stuff that we are made of. In the New Testament, though... In the New Testament, the, the word sarx usually carries uh, this idea of our human nature and, frankly, of our human sinful nature. Uh, that, that idea is implied so much that, that some translations uh, will say something like that. Your New International Version, for instance, uh, says, says something about human nature, sinful nature, uh, where, where the Greek word sarx is used. Um, but, but the word is flesh. This stuff that we are made of. And, 
And here in John chapter 1, we have the word, the logos of God becoming sarx, becoming flesh, taking on the same nature of, of his creation and then dwelling, uh, pitching his tent with us. Coming here, right, coming to that manger scene, it's off camera here, right, coming here and, and setting himself down and, and taking on this nature. With the twist, of course, that, that where, where we see flesh, usually, I said in the, in the New Testament, usually we have this idea of our, our, our sinful nature, right? Jesus did that without sin. He took on this flesh, he took on this stuff that we are made of, and he did it sinlessly, right? the way that it was intended to be, frankly. And that's the way it was supposed to have been in the garden, uh, but, but that failed. And, and so he took on this flesh. He took on the stuff of being human. And in that, in that step down to, to this, from, from, from his heavenly position to this flesh, the text says that we saw God's glory. Remember back there in Exodus when Moses wanted to see God's glory, but he couldn't? John tells us that the word became flesh, became this stuff that we're made of, and we beheld his glory. That thing Moses couldn't quite see, we see that in the person of Jesus Christ. We now can do what Moses couldn't do there on the mountain. Jesus is this declaration of God's greatness, of God's worth in, in the flesh of a human. And of course, it, it, it's the Advent season, and so we remember that, that, the, that flesh, that human, uh, was, was a, a baby born in a barn somewhere on the outskirts of Bethlehem. That is the flesh that he became. And in that, in that step down from the heavenly to, to the base, to the earthly, to, to this stuff, it says that we saw God's glory. It was and it still is a glorious thing that God took on this flesh. It doesn't look like fire and smoke on the mountain. And Moses asks to see God's glory and we've got fire and smoke and noise on the mountain. Isaiah sees the temple filled and, and falls on his face because, because this thing is so huge. Ezekiel speaks in terms that, that, that we still can't quite grasp because this vision is so big. Daniel describes uh, what is probably a theophany and, and, we, and, and we see this, this, this picture of of a man, but, but way more, and this glory around it. You have the Old Testament prophets whose, whose vision is big and, and mighty, and, and, and like I said, smoke and fire and noise and all of these things. And John ch tells us that, that in this flesh we beheld God's glory. In this spoken, this spoken declaration of who God is, we beheld his glory. It's an amazing thing. And, and John goes on, right, says that he was full of grace and truth. That those two things, grace and truth, were complete and mature and, and, and lacking nothing in him. And that's the, the, the word behind, uh, behind full, according to Thayer's dictionary, is, is lacking nothing and perfect. Perfect grace and perfect truth in the same person. 
I've always marveled at that because, because in, in human terms, too often, we don't manage those two things well. We tend to err to one side or the other. Been there and done that. And we either, we either tend to be truth tellers with no graciousness. I've been there and done that. And be a, a, a truth teller who, who has no, no graciousness, no gentleness, no, uh, no ability to to pick someone up from the truth that we have told them. Or we err the other way, and we pick up everybody, and, and, and we give grace without ever bothering to address the truth behind, behind the problem, behind what we're trying to fix. And, and we swing back and forth between those two. And John tells us that Jesus had those things in their fullness, in perfection, He did not swing from one to the other. When he spoke, he told the perfect truth with grace at every point. And in that, as well, we saw God's glory. His ability to speak both grace and truth in the same sentence, to bring them fully to the table, we saw his glory just as certainly as we see it in fire on the mountain. In verse 15, we get uh, the testimony of John the Baptist. John the Baptist says that, that he, Jesus, is a higher rank because he existed before me. Interesting linguistic note in there, that verb behind existed and me is the same verb that we hear Jesus use every time in the book of John he says, I am. So when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, it's the same verb John uses here. When he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. And when Jesus says those things, it's the same verb. I exist. And John says, he existed way before me. And not just, not just the six months difference in their age. John understood that the word, the logos, was preexistent. That he was and is still God. And in then verse 16, it says that we have received, uh, and of his fullness we have all received, of his completeness, of that ability to have all of that grace and truth, in that ability to show us God's glory, we uh, are recipients in that. Uh, remember, Paul in, in Ephesians chapter 1 speaks of us, uh, of us, uh, inheriting every spiritual blessing. We can inherit every spiritual blessing from Him because He had fullness. He had everything. And as He walked, walked in the flesh, uh, that blessing then was able to come to us, to His people. And we hear about grace and truth again in verse 17. And then finally, verse 18, we get to the big idea today. Uh, the, the Logos who became Sarx, right, the Word who became flesh, explains the Father to us. The God that Moses couldn't look upon is fully knowable to mankind in the person of Jesus Christ. And the, the, the God who had to cover Moses' face so that, so that Moses didn't look at him and die. is fully knowable. He has explained, Jesus has explained God the Father to us in, in a way that we could not know before. And he did it in that step down, right, that step down from the heavenly to the flesh. And, and of course, in, he stepped down to the flesh and then in his death and resurrection, uh, we could ultimately have forgiveness and have that restored relationship with Him. And all of that is, is mind-boggling. And, and it's even more so uh, when, when we pull the Advent story into that as well. Because it's amazing enough to think of a man, uh, to think of an adult in those terms. John, John doesn't, John's gospel doesn't talk about, about Jesus, the barn baby in Bethlehem. 
John talks about Jesus as a man. And, and so, so you pick up the story in John, and, and, and Jesus is, is an adult. And, and the story is amazing enough there, but it's even more mind-boggling when, when you take it all the way back to, to that advent, to the birth. Because it explains how huge God's love is for us. The level of servanthood that is involved in coming to that manger is incredible. <clears throat> the second person of the Godhead not only gave up his position in heaven to come be a man, <clears throat> he came, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, he came as a baby. <clears throat> he came to have nothing, no rights, no power whatsoever. To have come as an adult, <clears throat> if, he had, if he had come simply as an adult, uh, he then would at least have uh, some degree of self-determination, right? Freedom to move about, freedom to take care of his personal needs. Coming as a baby, he didn't even have that. He didn't have the ability to step up and, and say, I need this, or I am going to go here and do this thing. Right? Everything he needed had to be provided by someone else. And that's the, that's the nature of a baby. We've, we've, all, we've all held that baby and, and understood. They, they bring no power to the table. They have no self-determination whatsoever. That none of that exists. And for God Almighty to have stepped into that position, somebody had to change his diaper. It, it, is that real? For God Almighty to have stepped down there is an amazing act of servanthood towards us. And in that, he, he then experienced everything that we are. Right? While he gave up so much, he experienced everything we are in order to serve us because he loves his creation that much. Because God Almighty looked down from His throne and He said, this people that I created is worth stepping down from this position to absolute helplessness in order to show myself to them, in order to demonstrate to them my love. To demonstrate to them who I, God, am. All of that was demonstrated in the person of Jesus. That's who we remember right, as we sing in worship, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. And we, re we remember that He was coming to demonstrate that love for us. And so I want to encourage you as, as we go through the rest of the Advent season, right, as we sing the songs, as we, as we go through all of the other traditions and stuff that goes with the holiday, as, as you watch Linus quote Luke 2, all of that is happening because God wanted to be known by us. He created us to know Him. He wanted us to know Him. And He came as a baby to make that possible. And so I want to encourage you to know Him today. You will not need Google. Google will not get you there. You may know him because of the incarnation. You may know him because he became flesh. You need the faith that says, yes, I believe those things. And then know him today. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you that we can indeed know you. Thank you for choosing to come and to walk among us, choosing to come and, and be a helpless baby that you might show that immense uh, act of love and servanthood for us. I pray that we will all know you well today uh, through the rest of this season and always, that we might see your glory Glory is of the only begotten of the Father.
that you have demonstrated him. You have shown him to us. We thank you so much for that, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, we will be back uh, in this format again next week. Uh, and we should be uh, back meeting together next week as well. So please join us if you can. Awesome. Have a great week, everyone.